Hello, and welcome back to this three-minute song on a loop. Oh, we're also gonna do the raid guide for Garden of Salvation, so, you know, there's, there's that. Should probably start from the top, so let's go. Team composition for the first encounter, aka the bunny hop or the leapfrog, is pretty flexible. You'll be doing a fair amount of killing adds, but you won't really be fighting a boss, so focus on enemy slaying weapons instead of boss weapons. The only requirement, and I use that term loosely, are overload rounds to stop overload minotaurs. However, those can be killed pretty easily without them if you're at the proper power level. The lower the level of your team, the more you're going to want to bring overload rounds. Izanagi's burden has proven to be quite the success story early on in Garden of Salvation's life, able to one-shot key targets in this encounter and future encounters on top of being a good boss damage weapon. These key targets are Vex Hydras, aka Angelics, but I'll talk about those in a couple of minutes. In terms of subclasses, you're pretty free to pick whatever you want. Shadow Shot isn't terrible, but not really super necessary. The main mechanics for this fight are Voltaic Overflow and the Tether. Voltaic Overflow is pretty simple. The boss is going to float over to a spot and barf up a blob of energy on the ground. 30 seconds later, it'll barf up another one, and so on. You pick it up, and then you don't die, as this is the wipe mechanic. If the energy stays on the ground for too long, and by too long I mean about 3 to 5 seconds, you all die. The debuff from picking up the overflow lasts 2 minutes and 30 seconds. It doesn't do anything to your character, but if you're debuffed already and go to pick up another overflow, you die. But if you die, you lose your debuff, so you could just go pick up another one. Dying and being rezzed to pick up another overflow is used in situations where someone who could pick up a charge isn't close by, but you should never have a situation where you have to have someone die in order to pick up a new charge. The other mechanic is the tether. The tether spawns out of a box that is floating in the air. You activate the box by shooting it once, and then deactivate it by shooting it again. When active, the box will tether to a nearby player. If that player is within tether range of another player, it will tether to that next player, and so on. Once you're too far from the box or another tethered player, the chain breaks. You can stretch the tether pretty far. Once you see a red line instead of a blue line, or in future cases, a very thin black line instead of a thicker one, don't move too much more as you're at your limit. You also need to keep pretty strict line of sight. Any breaks will kill the chain. You have full movement controls while tethered, but you cannot shoot your gun. The objective of the tether is to break down the barriers blocking your path. This usually requires three players to chain together from the tether box to the end node, which looks like a weird three-dimensional plus sign. For example, to start the fight, players should tether from the box to the door's exit node. This will break down the door and start the fight. Every spot where you need to set up a tether in the entire raid can be done with three people. However, some of them might require hovering jumps or weird angles, so if you need to pull a fourth person to help, that's fine. Just make sure that that fourth person goes back to their team. As I mentioned earlier, this encounter is a game of leapfrog. The objective is to keep opening doors by killing Angelics to break the shield blocking the tether box that you need to use to break down a door to progress to the next area. Angelics spawn after killing adds in whatever the farthest room that is opened is. For this raid, killing Angelics is vital in three of the four encounters for various reasons. Split your team into two groups of three. Three people can connect every tether to door node in this encounter. Just be sure to stretch the tether to its limit and or make sure your angles are good. One of those teams is going to stay with the boss to pick up its hairball, I mean, its Voltaic Overflow, so that you don't wipe. When you pick up a Voltaic Overflow, there isn't really a reason that you need to stay in the room anymore, but for the purposes of staying organized, you should just stay with your group until your team gets the hang of the fight. Otherwise, the only thing that happens in this starting room is that fanatics and minotaurs will spawn in and they should just be killed. 
be on the lookout for Cyclops as well. They'll spawn on pillars in the middle of the map, and they will one-shot you almost regardless of your power level. The boss will shoot back at you as well, and hurts kind of bad if you're too close, so just stay out of line of sight. The adventure team will start the fight by tethering to the door and running forward. Your team of three will go through the doorway, killing all enemies in your way as fast as possible. When the angelic spawns, you'll want to kill that as fast as possible. Izanagi's burden with honed edge times four will one-shot it at proper power levels with a crit. Killing the angelic removes the shield from the tether box that your team will use to tether to the next door to break it open. When this happens, the boss in the first room will teleport forward to this second room, and now the team in that second room will be the team cleaning up Voltaic Overflow, while the team in the first room moves to the third room. The team now in the third room will do what the team in the second room just did, kill adds, spawn their angelic, find the tether box, unlock the door, and then the boss will teleport to the third room, and players in the second room will move to the fourth room. If you're killing things pretty quickly, then the boss should only drop two Voltaic Overflow on the ground. However, if the boss drops a third and you only have two people, one person just needs to grab another one and be rezzed after they die. Again, this should not be part of your normal strategy and should only be used if no other option is available. The fourth room has three nodes that you need to hit in order to unlock the door, but otherwise is the same experience. The angelic spawns by the locked door. After the boss teleports out of the third room, the team should group back up by meeting in the fourth room and moving on together into the field. The field of Cyclops. The boss will also be there dropping Voltaic Overflow on the ground. Therefore, your team needs to motor, running as fast as possible to catch the overflow while also killing the Cyclops so that you don't die. Again, Izanagi's burden stacked to four will one-shot them with a crit. You'll also have overload minotaurs in this area. The boss will drop three overflow on the ground that you'll need to pick up. Once the third is picked up, the boss will teleport away and you're done. Before we head to the next encounter, here's the location of a secret chest in the platforming section. Encounter number two is all about controlling the state of the field and killing angelics that spawn in. Again, you will not be fighting a boss in this encounter, so team composition and weapons should be focused on killing adds and angelics. Izanagi's burden works well for angelics, while a machine gun will do work on adds. You will also need anti-barrier rounds for early on in the fight. You won't be fighting a lot of enemies in this, it's very manageable, but we need to talk about a new mechanic needed for this fight called Enlightened. Enemies in this fight will eventually start spawning with white shields around them, usually immediately after you visit a relay at a corner. The white shields do nothing special, but you need to have the Enlightened buff in order to destroy them. You destroy shields by attacking the enemy in whatever way while you have Enlightened. After the shields are down, you can kill the enemies. Once a shield is destroyed, it will not regenerate either. Breaking these shields is important because if the Vex are allowed to sacrifice themselves too often, you will wipe. We'll talk about how to get enlightened in a moment. You're going to assign four people to corners, one person for each corner, along with two roamers who will help out the people at the corners when needed. The objective of the fight is to prevent the Vex from sacrificing themselves at the relays at the corners of the map while killing Angelics to steadily break down the center wall. Players will start at one corner of the square and kill adds to start the fight. An Angelic will spawn in the center path, which when killed will remove the shield on the tether box. 
The purpose of the tether box is to give the enlightened buff. Anyone in the tether, when it's connected from start to finish, finish being the relay, will get enlightened, which lasts for 45 seconds. You need at least two people in a tether to reach the end. On this very first one, I don't think it's a bad idea to just tether everyone so that everyone has enlightened, as when you go to the next relay, you may have shielded enemies already spawning. After the angelic dies, you should send all but one or two people down the left path to the next relay so that they can activate the next relay. Activating this relay will activate a portal that links back to the starting relay where you started the fight. As you go around the map, activating relays will activate these portals, which enables people to teleport back and forth to each other. This is important for two reasons. One, players can go to each other to refresh Enlightened, and two, roamers can help kill Angelics when they spawn in. After all four relays have been activated and all of the portals are active, the fight is purely about management. Players should call out whenever they need help with Angelics or need to rebuff. Note that the Angelics will disable the tether box when they spawn in, and there is no reason to not constantly reapply the Enlightened buff whenever you have time. Eventually, the middle of the room will break open, and all players should converge into the middle to fight off waves of Vex enemies and Angelics. Be sure to rebuff as a team whenever possible, and just keep killing. Supplicants will join the fray towards the end. These are self-destructing suicide harpies, so just be careful because they will one-shot you if you're too close. You should only need about one and a half to two minutes of fighting in the middle before the encounter is over. Once you grab your loot, a tether box will spawn. Chain this to the middle relay to start the next encounter. So, you've been chasing and tracking down the consecrated mines for half of the raid so far. The third encounter is where you take it down. Team composition matters a little bit here, as we'll actually be dealing some boss damage this time around. A Will of Radiance isn't bad if you want to run Luna Factions, but Rally Barricades work just fine and aren't super necessary. Weapons of Light will actually be very good here because of how boss damage works, along with Tether to slow the boss down a little bit. Again, Izanagi's Burden will be a good weapon this time for boss damage, along with grenade launchers. Something like Wendigo is pretty good here if you can get orbs. Otherwise, a grenade launcher with spike grenades and auto-loading holster is solid. Nighthawk is good here for hunters looking for more damage on the boss, while Warlocks could run Nova Bomb for instant boss damage purposes, or something for killing Vex if that's a problem. The goal here is to kill the boss by luring it to an overloaded relay. To overload a relay, you must pick up moats that are dropped from minotaurs and then drop them in the relay, 30 in total. If you're thinking, this sounds a lot like Gambit. It is, but with a bit more going on. Before you start, you'll split your team into two groups, Team Voltaic Overflow and Team Gambit. 3 and 3 is fine, as Team Gambit will probably not struggle to kill adds, at least when at the proper levels. Team Voltaic Overflow will be chasing the boss around as it drops Voltaic Overflow in four different spots in the arena. For the purposes of this video, we'll say that the tunnel with the rotating platforms is north, so Overflow will be dropped in the north, south, east, and west sections of the map. Voltaic Overflow works the same way as it did in the first encounter, except this time when you pick it up, you will become detained. The boss will then start charging an attack that will one-shot you, unless you stop it. To stop it, you must shoot the three red eyes that light up on its three fins, one on each fin. The problem is that it's pretty hard to do this by yourself, so you'll need teammates to help. The problem there is that if you're not detained, all of the eyes are red, so the detained needs to tell the team which eyes are red, as shooting the wrong eye means instant death. The eyes are only ever in two patterns, inner or outer. The eyes are set up in a way where each fin has two eyes, and one of them is closer to the middle. If all of the eyes that are red are closer to the middle, that's the inner call. Otherwise, it's outer. The person in the detain should shoot the eye in the top fin, then have the other two players go to the left and right side of the detained person. Left side shoots left, right side shoots right. This entire sequence is only about five seconds long. I'll be there. Hurt! 
Outer. After stopping the boss, it'll float back to the middle of the arena, shoot some people for a little bit, and then float off again to repeat this process. If Team Gambit is going quickly, then after the third time this happens, it should be time to do boss damage. However, if a fourth overflow is going to be dropped, then someone from Team Gambit needs to rotate into Team Overflow, and someone with the Overflow debuff should rotate to Team Gambit. Usually, the person that rotates in is someone who is already in the center of the room who has no moats. Team Gambit will be grabbing moats and defending the relay. Moats are dropped from Minotaurs, five at a time, who will be spawning and running towards the middle of the arena. The relay that you need to drop them into will be shown in-game via a message, and it'll also just have a giant beam of light shooting up from it. When you bank any amount of moats, you'll be given Enlightened for 45 seconds, which you will use to defend the relay from constantly respawning goblins coming from the sides. You'll need 30 moats in order to trigger the damage phase, but if any goblins get sacrificed, you may need to drop in more moats. The strategy for the moats is 5, 10, 10, 5. As in, player 1 will grab 5 moats from 1 Minotaur, go to the relay, and then bank. Then player 2 will grab 10 moats from 2 Minotaurs, go to the relay, bank, and replace player 1. Then player 3 grabs 10, replaces player 2. Then player 1 grabs the final 5 moats and drops them in the relay to trigger boss damage. The first Minotaur will spawn in the same aisle where the relay is. Try to let just one person scoop all of the moats, as splitting the moats will just slow you down, and the moats are on a timer once picked up. You will also spawn supplicant harpies whenever you bank moats, so keep that in mind. While you can do a 10-10-10 strategy, this timing is much tighter to pull off and isn't as rookie friendly. When the boss is drawn to the relay, all players should run there to get ready for damage. The boss will open up a lot of red eyes. You need to shoot all of them to make the boss vulnerable. When you're done, the boss's weak point will be the white spot in the center of its body, and you should fire away. You want big burst, because the boss will start to channel an attack that will kill everyone if not damaged hard enough. The boss will also be floating quickly back towards the center, so you need to chase it down a bit. This is why Weapons of Light is good. The buff lasts for 15 seconds as you chase the boss, and you can actually drop it in the hallway in order to scoop a buff while running. Shadow Shot will also slow down the boss a little bit, so use that here too. After the boss returns to the center, this process repeats itself until the boss dies, and you have four boss damage phases to kill. Note that upon returning to the center, you may need to rotate people from each team to accommodate for the Voltaic Overflow that might still be on players from Team Overflow. And that's the fight. It's two teams doing their own thing to make sure that no mechanics wipe the raid. After the Consecrated Mind is defeated, you'll take a beautiful scenic route to the Sanctified Mind, where all the mechanics you've learned so far merge together into one boss. Before we go, here's the location of the second secret chest. I'll see you guys at the final boss.